Good morning, afternoon, evening. We have lots of um, attendees from the US and from the UK today. We are very excited about this topic, Future Proofing Your Organization, Essential Strategies for Succession Planning and Talent Development. <clears throat> I'm Abby Mood, Marketing Director at Velocity Advisory Group. And uh, yeah, we're really excited for this um, important topic today for HR leaders. Um, we have two experts that are presenting today, Bob Weinhold and Ian Barrow. Ian is the Client Services Director at WorkBuzz and has been partnering with organizations to help them become more effective for over 25 years. Working primarily at board and senior management team levels, he helps organizations to identify, understand, and improve the underlying drivers of their culture, employee engagement, and employee experience. He has worked across both the public and private sectors um, and developed a keen understanding of how to listen to the voice of all stakeholders, preventing what he hears or presenting what he hears in an accessible way and using this to gain buy-in to strategies for making change happen. He has a deep passion for researching people's behaviors and motivations, transforming organizations into more effective and inspiring places to work. Bob Weinhold is a partner at Velocity Advisory Group and has spent his career helping individuals, teams, and organizations accomplish what they did not think possible. At his core, he connects deeply to help businesses and individuals achieve results um, that they could not imagine but knew were necessary while engaging employees to drive innovation, growth, and sustainability. Bob has humbly served as CEO and COO for hospitals as well as healthcare organizations, and at Velocity, he manages the executive coaching and family business practices. Um, he's consistently called upon to develop next generation leaders for succession and help senior family members transition responsibilities while mitigating risk. Um, so we'll start. Th there we go. Quite a lot about you and I, Ian. I hope it goes well. <laughs> All right. So um, I, I and that was that was the shorter versions of what I originally had. Um, all right. So, Ian, I will hand it over to you to kick things off. And um, yeah, let's get going. Brilliant. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to start really with a quote. And my go to person is always Simon Sinek, to be honest. You can always get a good quote from Simon. And um, I, the, the quote I, I'm, I'm using here is, he, he said a star, and I'm going to correct him slightly, a star wants to see himself or herself uh, rise to the top and a leader wants to see those around him or her um, rise to the top. So, um, you know, that broadly, I guess, that we, we all agree with that. You know, if you're, if you're an individual who's ambitious and you want to drive on and you want to uh, move, move on in with your organisation, you, you want to be able to do that and, and be facilitated to do that. And, and leaders... Obviously, if you're a good leader, a good manager, you want you want those people to succeed around you. But I guess there's a there's a big question. I kind of want to challenge Simon a little bit on that. You know, how well do we as organizations plan for succession? How well do we enable individuals within the organization to be the best the best self? And how do we support um, these rising stars in our organizations in, in whatever way? How do we support them um, to, to kind of rise to the top, if you like? And I guess the other the other thing is how good are we at creating um, a culture of succession planning within organisations when we've got so many um, conflicting challenges and conflicting things around us uh, that we need to invest in, both in terms of time and money in terms of organisations. So whilst I broadly agree with, with the quote, I think we just need to challenge that a little bit and just see um, where we are as organisations in, in, in the world today. I think the, the the first thing though we I just want to mention is that the, the workplace itself has been changing for some time. You know, in, in terms of who we are as organizations and what we look like, um, it's over the last 20 years, maybe even 30 years, it's been changing quite dramatically. So in terms of um, the way we keep colleagues connected, you know, in, uh, as organizations, it's no longer in person. Obviously, many organizations work in a hybrid way, so that has had to change. There's been the disruption of traditional sectors as well. Obviously, in terms of retail, we all shop from home. We all shop in terms of groceries or anything else. We the we we call a cab or a taxi using our phones now. We don't stand on the street corner or make a telephone call. So 
the tr the way we've been working and the way the workplace and the way sectors have been running has been changing for some time. There's this preconception that since the pandemic, you know, maybe four years ago now, that that, that made us change the way we think. But what the pandemic did was actually accelerate that thinking and accelerate this, these different ways of working. So we're seeing different ways of working because people have different values about what they want from the workplace. And those values need to align with what people are looking for. So in terms of succession planning, that might be moving forward in a different way. It may be in terms of what we're looking for from organisations, how they treat us, how they work with us. But it's also about recruiting and retaining talent as well. That's some of the biggest challenges that we've seen, certainly over the last 18 months. So in terms of how organisations are, are retaining people, how they're recruiting people, and how they're reimagining the workplace, it's been happening for a long, long time. But certainly the, the, the pandemic has accelerated that. So this whole thing around um, recruitment, around retaining people, um, feeds into that need to succession plan. Um, keeping your best people, retaining your best people in the organisation. But in saying that, we know that it's a kind of volatile workplace out there. So um, if you look at um, the, the, the term, a new war for talents, I first heard that term about 25 years ago, but it seems to um, be back on the rise again in terms of what organisations need to do to keep the best talent and recruit the best talent. And just some stats for you, this... This first one, 40%, 41%, sorry, of those surveyed were considering quitting a change of professions this year. And that was a, a Microsoft survey of around about 30,000 people globally. So we can see that churn in, 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 in the marketplace. This, this next stat, 38% of workers plan to quit within the next six to 12 months. That was a UK survey of, of technology workers. And again, similar kind of numbers, similar kind of stats. And this last one is an average of a number of um, different um, studies that I came across on LinkedIn, um, and I averaged them all out, to be honest. And it looks like around about two-thirds of people are planning to look for a new role in 2025. So it's not just about the now, and it's not just about what we've seen over the last 18 months. Um, certainly, the future is also looking quite volatile in the way people think. So that need to recruit and that need to hold on to your best people, it makes succession planning even more important for organizations. I like to jump in and just say, you know, from my experience in running kind of larger systems and then through all the clients that I work with, uh, I want to say there are no guarantees when it comes to succession planning and how and why and when that happens. Uh, I've seen it happen really clearly and I've seen it not happen clearly. Yesterday I was in the president's cabinet of a, a very large university institution here in the States and um, with a bunch of medical professionals as well who have the knowledge that calamity in medicine or something catastrophic can get can happen and people are immediately removed from your system even if you had just recruited them to a role and having uh, unfortunate circumstances from some of my clients where they have folks that are in their 40s and 50s with perceptively a great deal of runway left in adding into their organization have a catastrophic illness. So uh, you compare that with part of the workforce changing and people moving in and out of roles quicker and opportunities and frankly, certain business sectors are much more hungry for employees of great talent that they make offers quite lucrative for people to jump ship when they might not have been perceived. So there aren't guarantees in when, um, as we if we re to use a bullpen and in, in baseball analogy, you're not guaranteed of when the call to the bullpen comes for the next person to come in to pitch. But HR people, talent development people, folks at the very highest levels of the organization Y'all are responsible to make sure that there's somebody that can step in without too much impact to the organization over too long a period. So lots of different reasons why succession needs to happen and uh, it's not an exact science. And I think just building on that, Bob, I think that, you know, the the, the critical thing about succession planning and, and, you know, we all have a sense of what succession planning is. Um, but the critical thing is that it has to be a long-term strategy. It's not a, a strategy you can just turn on um, for those reasons that you've just stated. You know, it's not something where that you can just react to. 
succession planning has to be the as as part of your culture. It has to be a long term cultural embedded um, strategy across your whole organisation. And just for the, the the sake of completeness, you know, it's a process for identifying potential future leaders, senior managers. And critically, people in key roles that, that within the business as well. It's not just about leadership and having succession planning for leadership. It's about losing that really key employee that's a, a specialist in their role. You know, how do you replace an individual like that when they leave your organisation and they leave not just with their skills, but they leave with the knowledge that they've had probably built up over many years. So it has to be a long term strategy the way you're counteracting turnover and uncertainty and, and those kind of uncertainties that Bob listed out there, but also where you're empowering people to, to operate successfully, even when people leave, you know, so there's no panic when somebody leaves. It's a, it's a kind of structured, easy process to fill that gap and fill that hole as, as you go forward. And it just stops that complacency in the organizations. It maintains capacity and it critically is in terms of outputs or whether whether that be actual outputs or, or a service that you're delivering, there's no interruption in that. It just continues as normal. So succession planning is really critical, not just about um, filling gaps and filling gaps that people leave, but it's critical for your organization that, that you address it. So I guess I guess the big question is how how good are we? How good are we at, at succession planning? Well, the stats would say we're not that great. You know, the, this is this is data from the um, Chartered Institute of Personal Development in the UK, and this was a, a European-wide survey. And they found that only less than half of organisations have a, a workforce planning strategy um, in place, and that's based on whether it be current workforce or, or the predicted future workforce. So but it's not great in terms of the way we plan for succession and we plan for the future in terms of our people. Um, and around the, just again under half of people, around forty three percent, take a real ad hoc approach to recruitment. So they are the people who firefight. These are the organisations that, when somebody leaves, there's a bit of a panic. We better get a job advert out. We better go and find somebody. You know, they don't have that plan in place to to fill the hole immediately. And finally, we we see around fifty seven percent site up skilling employees as the most common response to recruitment difficulties so again this is this need to firefight you know when something goes something goes wrong and people leave or we we have a skills issue in one part of the organization or the workforce we immediately jump on the upskilling um, bandwagon whereas that's something that should be done all the way along Re understand who your key players are understand who your rising stars are and keep them upskilled for all eventualities as, as you come out of that kind of process so what's the three key challenges? I think there's real three key challenges that we're facing at the moment, which you know don't help succession planning, but are three key challenges that we must address to ensure that we have a um, good succession planning in place. I think the first one is that the the makeup of the work for workplace is shifting. You know the the makeup of the kind of people we have in our workplaces is shifting dramatically as generations change. And if you if you look back two years ago to 2022 and forward to 2032, we're going to see a real shift in terms of um, in key individuals within these different generations in the workplace. And around two thirds of, the, of people in future in 2032 are going to be either millennials um, or they're going to be Gen Z. And they certainly have a different view on life, on life and, and the workplace than um, I'll I'll declare myself as a Gen Z, Gen X, the different view in, in terms of what the organization and what work means to people. We've also get, got Gen Alpha coming through and they're, a, they're an interesting group as well. You know, Gen Alpha are going to be um, coming through into the workplace and they're gonna represent around 11% in, in, in kind of eight years time or so. But if you think of who Gen Alpha are now, you know, they're aged 10 to 12 years old. And if you think of how they, behave now as, as children and, and teenagers. Um, you know, the, the, they learn at school um, by screens. They occupy themselves. Their hobbies are basically screen-based. They, uh, they placate themselves. You know, when they're, when they're upset, you see uh, mothers and parents giving babies, you know, younger kids a, a screen to watch if they're upset, you know, what, what some cartoon or something like that. Um, they also socially communicate by screens. 
And and in fact, somebody recently labelled them screen ages, which I thought was brilliant. I wish I thought of that. But but when they eventually come into the workplace, the way they're going to want to work and and learn and develop within the workplace is by screen. So, but if they're in a retail environment or they're in a manufacturing environment, they're not going to have that. So, the Gen Alpha coming into the workplace in over the next ten years is going to be a real challenge for for all organisations. And I think the other thing is when you think when you look at the length of service for these different generational groups. At the moment, the average length of service for millennials is under three years. It's around two years, nine months. And for Gen Z, it's around two years, three months. So again, as organizations, the challenge is not just about how different generations think about work and how they work within the workplace. It's also the length of service. So succession planning then becomes really difficult because you succession plan with, with individuals in these different generations. But the reality is, the likelihood is for many of them, they're not going to stick around for the long term future. And if you look and, and the way they approach work is important as well and the way they think about work. So for millennials, you know, that work life balance and, and personal well-being is really important when they're looking for new jobs and they want to be coached and mentored. Um, and similarly, for, for Gen Z, they're looking for those value and in, values and in-person interactions. But again, that length of service, that average length of service is really key here. So everything, if you think of my generation, it might have been, hey, Ian, stick around for 10 years. You'll do well. You'll get promoted. You'll have a good job. And in that period, we'll develop you and, and, and uh, as, a, as a rising star for succession. Um, but everything that now has to be levered, if you like, into a three-year period before individuals move on, on average. So... That's a real challenge that we've got different generations who think differently and are looking for lower length, lower periods of time within organisations, but are still looking for all the development that they get. I think the second challenge is that retention is becoming more difficult. So if you think about um, the, the kind of issues that you've got with retention, the biggest challenges, it's all around these issues around offering competitive salaries, um, flexible working arrangements and meeting these ex these employee expectations of what the future looks like and building our company future. So all those kind of things are really critical to these generations of the future. But the when you ask organisations, and these, this is from our own study, the, the state of engagement that, that we, we produce every year at Workbus, 65% um, of those organisations questioned um, do not see um, re retention and retaining existing employees getting any better. Um, in fact, only a third of the seat getting any easier. So that, that whole process of how do we hang on to people so we can we can plan succession and we can plan for the future is really tough. People aren't sticking around and it causes real headache when you're trying to plan for that future and, and, and look at that longer term process. And finally, the, the 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 third one, and probably the most important one, actually, um, people managers, i.e. managers who manage people, team leaders, I guess, um, they're really time poor. If I go back 20 years or 25 years, you know, the task of a team manager, of a people manager, was to manage the process, the service they were delivering, or how many widgets they were making, or the production and manage a team of people with, with a with a kind of one size fits all management approach. That was the job. That was it. But if you look at what we're asking people managers to do now, it's well, we're asking them to look after the well being and mental health of their team and and equip them with skills to deal with that. We're asking them to look at the tools and monitor the success. We're asking them to recognize people and affirm them. We're asking them to be corporate individuals and and walk the talk in terms of corporate values. We're asking them to communicate more and trust and, and not micromanage and empower, et cetera, et cetera. And down the bottom there in that box, somewhere in, in amongst all of that stuff, as well as doing the day job, we're going to ask them to succession plan and mentor people and coach people. So managers, people managers are really time poor. It's a huge challenge. So if you think of those three big challenges in terms of Different generations have different values and different um, lengths of service. We've got this whole thing about um, retention and, and, and the issues around that are critical. But internally in our own organisations, we're asking managers to do more and more. And one of those is succession planning. It's no wonder we're poor at it and it's no wonder that it, it falls by the wayside.
Outstanding, Ian. Thank you for uh, laying the foundation as to why and uh, the importance of doing succession planning. My role now is really to help go into some of the practical and tactical and how do you get these things done in an organization. So uh, in the next few moments, I'm going to cover what's HR's role and, and kind of the uh, learning and development role in this process. How do we identify future potential leaders and, and what kinds of things need to be done? How do we help CEOs and CFOs understand what needs to happen next? How do you keep your people engaged along the way while they don't know what's happening? I like the analogy of, of the duck on the water uh, that's moving really, really fast. But if somebody from shore looks and there's, they can't see movement up top, they don't know what's happening. And oftentimes they divert their attention to go external. And then what does succession planning even look like in some flat organizations? And how do we look at that? So my hope is I'll be able to address these for you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. All right, I'm going to be a little over the top here, but HR people, there's times where I bet you feel like you need to have a hard hat on because whether or not you are uh, directly implicated in terms of the person leaving the company or something happening to them, usually things come to you to be able to fill that role. Somebody's got to help us in that process. And so whether you involved in succession planning or not, more than likely, you get a call that says, hey, I need your help getting this done. So we have to look at what HR's critical role is. And in, as an Ian indicated, if you're seen in the organization as fighting fires and just being very reactive, it makes your role a lot harder. However, if you can justify to the senior folks, this is an economic driver we can get greater opportunity in terms of revenue or expansion or increase our market share, or it costs us a lot to bring in great executive placement firms like Caldwell Partners or somebody like that. It costs us to do that. And there are ways that we can better prepare our organization. So there is a, a financial impact on that. I mentioned yesterday, I was sitting with the president's cabinet and they said, so help me understand what's the right mix of internal versus external people that we should have developed internally versus looking externally. And here's another part of succession planning. It matters what your strategic plan is. If you're just going to grow your company organically in the same ways you've been doing and delivering things, chances are good you can develop a lot of that talent on the inside. If you've got some big strategic initiatives that are far afoot from what you're delivering now, then the need to get outside people or develop your inside people with different skill sets than is currently in your system, that's really important. So recognize that from a leadership sales standpoint to help convince people in the organization, you need to be able to justify those things. With Ian talking about the short time period of people in an organization, if we're looking at two and a half years to three and a half, maybe four years, HR does a great job about looking across your employee base and saying, we should have a washout and attrition rate of this many people every two to three years. Where does that hit across apartments? What do we need to do for that? And then the important part, I think from a good succession planning when it happens, is it looks at risk. If somebody walks in a critical position, middle of the organization, top of the organization, what are they leaving with that would be difficult to replace? And HR in particular has a great knowledge of what are those historical knowledge bases and the relationships that people have that would be very difficult to replace in a short period of time. So how do we mitigate risk? How do we look at rewarding people so that they can stay involved and be able to see future parts of the acceleration of the organization by them moving into a new place that would strategically fill things? And then how do we connect that to the C-suite so that they invest and develop in that program? Great. So in this process, folks were talking yesterday and they said, hey, um, if we just have coaching, will that work out in terms of succession planning? Or if we just have a leadership development program, will that mitigate the reason for other things? The reality is, is there needs to be a combination of both. 
but you're looking at how do you identify high potential employees in your organization. And here's a couple key factors, uh, four or five things that I want you to take away with. You're going to be able to see great employees by those that put forth discretionary effort above and beyond what you're being asked to do. They sign up for other things. They show up early. They stay later. They're asking a lot of those questions. So what are those things that we'd look for? The next is a cultural fit. I work with a great client who had um, president of one of his great companies need to leave. They filled it not with somebody that necessarily has great knowledge within that business vertical, but they have such strong cultural and business knowledge that the ability to transfer them in there to run great programs and run a great organization had more to do with the culture and the business knowledge. So you want to look at people who have a great cultural fit as people that are high potential employees. I always talk about the folks that have a curiosity and a willingness. Are they curious? Do they stay connected? Do they ask questions? And then are they taking on other things, doing things in that discretionary effort? If they're asked to do something, do they take that and move it forward? Those are indications of kind of the DNA of high potential employees. And finally, uh, that they show initiative in how they're doing other projects and how they really manage overall things at their level. They anticipate the needs of people above them, and they also provide resources for folks that might be lateral or below. Final area is in terms of professional development. Are folks just doing things in the workplace, in your business? Or are they doing things outside on a personal, a philanthropic, a, an industry area that shows they're invested? Those are all really important characteristics of high potential employees. So then how do you evaluate them? How do you look at what's necessary? I usually have folks kind of think about in organizations and HR can do a great job about this. Where are they? Do they have a desire to move? Would they relocate? What kinds of things might stand in the way on a personal or a professional level to do that? Um, some folks feel like they're at a maximum level of where they want to contribute in an organization. They may be great, but to be asked to be on call, to be asked to travel, maybe that's just not something they want to do. Um, in terms of experience, do they have experiences across organizations? in other industries, some of those things will allow you an insight to see whether or not that person can learn quickly, adapt in a fast way, and acquire new information and relationships. That's that experience piece. Um, I look for core strengths on um, interviews. I ask for kind of personal and professional examples of adaptability and taking on new roles. When you were handed a lot more in something in your life, how did you manage it? How did you deal with it? Those are six successor readiness components that would be helpful to take into consideration? And then what opportunities for growth are they looking for as well as the organization? We have a tool that we use. Once somebody is generally identified as a successor, if you can see this closely, we look at who's in the role now and what on a, can we rate them on a scale of one to seven in terms of things like uh, where is their leadership currently? How do they look at the organization strategically? Do they understand compliance and governance? Where are they on risk mitigation? And we give those folks a score. And if you have an incumbent in the role, that, that creates a score profile for them. When you're looking at successors, it may be very helpful for you to score that person. And then you start to see the deltas. I just sent this out to a client a couple hours ago and who had moved somebody up into a new role and say, look at that. Even after you create the judgment or do a scoring on somebody, hand it to them. They might know the person if they're stepping up in the organization. Where did they see the incumbent in each of those areas? Where do they see themselves? And with that right-hand column of the delta, you get to figure out where are the areas of greatest versus where are the areas of smallest difference? And then which of those would you need to focus on maintaining which of the ones do you want to close the gap? Which ones might be even better? And then great HR, people development, executive leaders say, when should we address each at which time? So that's a really important part of that next piece. 
All right. So then let's look at how do you develop those high potential employees? Some folks would be ready for a role right away. That's easy. You help move them in and then it becomes about the onboarding process. In terms of great development of people that might need six or nine, 12 months, 18 months, those are the people that have to be developed. I was talking with Christine Miller earlier today from Malenta, and she's very intentional about how do you do development plans that allow people to succeed and excel in their current role, but how do you allow them to leverage that further for the organization's benefit, as well as be congruent with their, their efforts and what they're looking at. So thinking about a tailored development plan for succession. Some companies use mentoring programs, we provide a lot of coaching and I get called in a lot on the individual coaching side to say, when you're getting ready, what are the things that you need to accomplish? Where are the skill sets and how do you really look at the perception of yourself in the organization that allows you to sit in that role and be most successful? Some of those things that we employ on the coaching side are things like 360s. How are you perceived by other people in your current management role or in a leadership role and what might you need to do to change that perception when you step up to an executive role? A lot of times when folks are making lateral moves or I have been identified from a place of moving laterally up, part of their challenge is how do you differentiate from peer groups that you've been doing? So we look at that and talk about that in terms of developing your high potential employees. Um, Velocity also provides uh, things like an executive leadership program, but also developing an emerging leaders program. We teach in a 70-20-10 model. There's a lot of on-the-job application that you can do, some classroom and some cohort learning. Those are things that allow those people to develop leadership skills that get applied both in their role and across the organization, which is critically important. Great organizations find the way to give stretch goals, stretch assignments, cross-departmental things. I think in the coaching piece, I often encourage people to get a relationship with somebody in finance because they can learn about those elements there. Also understanding what people are doing in the marketing, in the sales realm, so that they've got a greater perception of the industry. Senior roles often demand that. Job rotation. Uh, we just did something at, at our employee offsite called a day in the life of and it gives you a perception of what other things are happening in other departments, that's a great place. If somebody hears that, do they demonstrate initiative, curiosity, and willingness to go and learn about those other areas? Those are ways that you identify and develop your high potential employees. So the, the workplace just, it, it provides a lot of opportunities for us to identify successors within? How do you develop plans to do that? Make sure that that matches with the culture or the value statements or the essential behaviors that you're trying to develop and make sure that that's also meeting your future strategic needs. If we develop people just for the sake of leadership development, but it's not done within the context of where the business is growing and going, we don't have people that are ready for the future of the company. So let, let's pause there, I think, and it might be a good place for us uh, to ask any questions if they're available. Yeah, that was that was great. Thank you both. We have a couple of questions here for whoever whoever wants to, to speak to them. The first one, how often should you revisit and update a succession plan? I think um, I'll take this, Bob. I, I think revisit is probably the wrong word. I think it's a constant. Um, you've got to keep evaluating um, your workforce and evaluating the people and, and look for those. Well, one, look for where you, you've got your most attrition in the organisation and two, whether you're losing people in critical roles, whether they be leadership roles or any other role for that matter. Um, I think it's, it's a case of having a, a, a constant eye. Now, whether that's HR's role, or, or, or part of their role and whether that's the you know line managers and people managers across the organization it's probably a mixture of the two actually but it's, um it's a constant thing rather than something that you revisit every so often uh agreed the the content that i would add or the context that i would add i do a great deal of strategic planning with organizations it always is a component of people and talent development and succession that we revisit on a yearly basis 
that has a component that is addressed throughout the strategic plan so it's pushed forward. Most times in organizations that is uh, sponsored by the executive team that includes HR and delivered through the human resources component or the people in the talent development component. And then as Ian said, that's pushed down to managers and line managers in terms of performance-based discussions. Um, how and which departments really need to be ramped up for greater turnover or opportunities for growth. And you both talked about HR working with the C-suite and, and working with business plans. So I think this next question is great along those lines. How can human resources address resistance to change from current leadership? Uh, maybe I'll jump in first on this one, Ian. I, yeah. I think if it's not, if succession plan is not clearly and factually tied to business goals, business performance, and financial implications, it becomes a nice to have rather than a need to have. When HR is truly a business partner in the development of the organization, your human capital, your people that you need to be able to elevate up and need to be able to bring in, that's the succession planning that's so critical and must be done. So uh, when I when I coach HR people, I talk to them about, are you aligning the succession planning and the other efforts that you're doing with the business goals that the organization has agreed are most important? When you do it that way, rather than something that is phrased independently as the importance of culture and leadership development. All of those parts are very important, but your greatest tie-in with the senior leadership is risk, financial gain or compromise, and strategic alignment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, also, it's, also about, it's also about being aware of, of, of change around you as an organization as well that links to strategic goals. So AI is a perfect example of that. We, we don't know where AI is going to take us as organizations, but you certainly have to be prepared for it. You certainly have to be prepared that it's going to change your workplace, the roles within your workplace. And, and in fact, in 10 years' time, some roles won't exist because of AI. So preparing people to um, for that eventuality, if you like, is, is critical. And that's part of succession planning as well, making sure people are, are planning for the future and what that feels like for them within the workplace. And then lastly, um, can you speak a little more about using uh, 360s to assess leadership fit and how that the 360s fit into um, succession planning? Um, I can give some practical examples. In the, in the last four weeks, I've been called directly from either private equity groups or business owners or uh, a CEO that said, I need this person to get a better sense of who they are and how they're seen by everyone in the organization, or they won't be able to last in their role, or they certainly won't be able to step up in their next role. So there's a clear perception right now that some employees in the workforce don't have clarity as to how they're perceived across the organization. And from a delivery standpoint, I, I usually say crassly, they can put up a great score on the scoreboard, but they don't get credit for it if they're not understanding how they're seen in the organization. And so when you're identifying high potential leaders or when you've identified an incumbent and a successor, a 360 provides valuable understanding for that individual and organizational feedback as to how they are seen in the delivery of their results. And if folks have a significant disconnect, it's too cumbersome for the organization to elevate them into that role at the impact that they have around them. So we use 360s as a part of that, um, usually once the person has been decided. However, I'm being asked to come into a couple of other organizations where they say we've got two or three potential leaders moving up to this next role. How can you help us decide? And a 360 valuation, if done in the right context, can be very clarifying to the individuals and the organization. Andy, do you want to add anything to that? No, Bob's Bob's got the expertise on 360, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. All right. 
Well, that was it for today. Um, thank you everyone who joined us. Um, we we're just we're really excited to talk about this topic. It's come up a lot in client conversations and and um, I've seen it a lot in the, the HR community as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like more information on Velocity Advisory Group or WorkBuzz, there's a link right there on the screen. Um, we have a, a really great partnership between the two companies where we work together on, on a lot of things around um, employee engagement, um, leadership development, executive coaching, et cetera. So um, thank you again for joining us. And we'll send out this recording after along with the successor readiness tool that, that Bob kind of gave you a little preview of. And then the um, the report that Ian cited some of his statistics from earlier. So I hope everyone has a great day and we'll see you next time.